episode 516. Book talk begins at 26 minutes. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 516, We Meet Again. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? It has been so long since we have had a book to read. And now we have one. And we're about to read it together. And I'm so excited. There's uh, so much going on with this book and the world right now. <laughs> it's it's a little bit crazy talk. Uh, because of that, I am, I am going to be sharing a whole lot of information and links out to things, both to distract and amuse you, as well as be useful and, I hope, interesting for you. So, before we get to our book, I wanted to say happy 14th anniversary. I know many Craftlet listeners have been here since the early days in 2006, and Thank you so much for sticking around. It's great. It's been especially great since this whole stay-at-home thing happened because finally technology caught up with us in a way that worked. And Tuesday morning for me on the East Coast of the United States, uh, very early Tuesday mornings for me on the East Coast of the United States, but a sane amount of time for people in other time zones. I have a Tuesday chat where we are getting together on Zoom and sharing what we're reading, what we're working on. It gives us, uh, those of us who are stuck at home with no one to show our craftiness to, or or maybe more appropriately, nobody who is going to say, oh, where did you get that yarn? Um, it gives us a chance to share what we're doing and share the patterns that we're using. Uh, and it's not just knitting. There's lots of stuff going on. And people are also coming with uh, the books they're reading and sharing kind of like a little book commercial. This is the book. This is the author. This is what it's about. That's why I like it. I have found several really fun books based on uh, recommendations from those chats already. So Tuesday is, um, we have Australia and New Zealand and... Uh, the UK and Sweden and Germany and Denmark. Um, I'm trying to think if we've gotten any other other localities. I think that's it for our big countries for Tuesday morning. Uh, oh, and the United States, because we have some crazy people here who also get up at 5 a.m. with me. Uh, and then on Thursdays, that's 7 o'clock p.m. at night on the east coast of the United States. And that gets most of the United States and quite a few people from the UK as well. So uh, I'm having a great time. For one thing, I finally get to see many people who I have been corresponding with regularly for years, which is awesome. But I'm also having a lot of fun just seeing what everybody's working on. It's, it's just great to have smiling faces who don't live with me <laughs> showing up twice a week. I get to have fun with you. And it's it's been a blast. So everybody's welcome. Totally free. If you really just need to talk to some people who get you, please join in. We have we have a good time. And we've even had Aaron Ziegler from Chop Bard Podcast. And Julie Davis from Forgotten Classics, who you might remember. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them have showed up to Thursday nights now, so that's been fun. And my former student, Damani, who just started a new podcast. It's very exciting stuff. And I will have more information on that podcast for you next week. And if you 
weren't at that Thursday chat, just so you know, uh, you've already heard from him via audio once when there was the, uh, the police shooting that was happening in Dallas. He was there and he was there with police officers who were friends of his. And he had a, a unique perspective on the whole thing. Um, he's African-American. He's married to a white woman. And a lot of his friends over his life have been all different races. So he's, he's good at listening and thinking. And his insights are unique. So I'm very much looking forward to listening to his podcast, which just, just started. So more on that next week, as I said. So today I got up early. I came to the basement, which is where I usually am when I'm recording the the chats. So you've gotten to see my little weird studio space that I've set up here. Um, I am sitting here with my chai tea latte that I made with a brand new, really not very expensive, milk frother. And I said this on Tuesday morning, you wouldn't expect something like a milk frother to make me so happy, but it's a little pot so you can clean it, which is huge. And you can put cold milk in and set it down and put the lid on. And you can either have it blend whatever's in there. So if you wanted to make hot chocolate, you could do that. And it would come out creamy and rich. If you want to froth the milk, you put in a little bit less milk, put one little doohickey extra on the turny bit. <laughs> These are the technical terms you understand. And then you get this fabulous milk foam. I have been putting <laughs> frothed milk on my oatmeal. I have been putting it, I've been putting it everywhere I can think of to put it. It has made me so happy. I have no explanation for that. It just there. So chai tea latte with foamed milk and a little bit of cinnamon on top. Lovely way to start the day. And then I dove into organizing all of the notes that I've been making for you about things to know as well as Bronte information for you. And boy, have I collected a bunch. All of it's in the show notes for this episode, craftlit.com slash 516. That'll get you here. And as before, if for some reason iTunes or the Craftlit site go down, you can always find episodes either on the Craftlit app, which you can get for any kind of digital device you've got. It exists on all the platforms. Or you can go to craftlit.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N. That's actually the company that hosts the feed, that holds the audio files and sends the podcast audio out to all of the different places, Spotify, Stitcher, phones, computers, iHeartRadio. I can't remember all of them. YouTube, everything. So... That that site has never gone down in 14 years. 14 years. Can you believe this? 14 years. If you want to see what thing two looks like, <laughs> we put a, a recording that he really wanted to make. We put it up on the YouTube channel, the Craftlet YouTube channel, and it's on Harley Quinn, the Joker's girlfriend. There was a young adult graphic novel that was released not too long ago. And he really, really, really wanted to talk about it. And he wanted to talk about it like a piece of literature. And so he wanted to record this episode. So we did. I have no idea if we'll ever do one again. He had a lot of fun doing it, but but you can see my my 16-year-old. 16, thing two. 16. I know. Because he was two and a half when I started, the, not even two and a half, two and a third when I started the podcast. So <laughs> time, it moves on. Uh, things to know. Coronavirus is not killed by sunlight. Coronavirus is killed, so far we think, by uh, UV sterilizers. So um, sometimes at manicure salons, you'll see them put uh, tools into a little 
it looks like a toaster oven and then it's got that bluish purple light on it. That's the kind of stuff that kills coronavirus. If you're not lucky enough to have something like that and you want to sterilize things, uh, I am hearing stories about people putting masks into ovens. I do not know if that is working. I can neither confirm nor deny, but I am willing to bet dollars to donuts that someone listening does know. So please either call in or write in to share uh, quality known information that we can then disseminate. And if you're going to call in, that's area code 206-350-1642. And of course, if you call in and you send me audio that way, I'm uh, it is the understanding that I carry with me that you are agreeing to put that audio on the podcast. If you say something that you don't want me to play on the podcast, just let me know at the beginning of the recording. I'd rather have you say this rather than play my voice, or this is just between the two of us and it was faster to call than it was to write an email. Totally get it. Just let me know. Mask research. We have gotten in the United States very uneven information about COVID-19, the coronavirus. Some of that is due to how things work right now in the United States. Some of that is due to the fact that it's a new disease and people are learning things about it as we go. However, yesterday, the United States Surgeon General and the head of the CDC got up in front of an audience of reporters and said unequivocally that they wear masks when they are not presenting on TV. They pulled them out of their back pockets. They both had masks. They were both either, uh, I think the CDC guy had a real regular Olsen mask, which are the ones that are fitted and look more like Bane, <laughs> depending on how they're, they're decorated. Um, whereas the, the Surgeon General's looked like it was a cloth version of a surgical mask, which probably means it was actually made out of HEPA filter material. Neither of them had respirators like the N95s do. So I have collected at heatherordover.com slash masks, all of the useful information I've been able to find on the mask technology when it comes to filtration. There have been studies that have been done and I have a link out to a live stream, a Q and A live stream from the, the people who did these tests. And if you don't have time to watch the live stream, here's the upshot. COVID-19 particles, the actual virus particle is 0.1 microns. So for those of you who spin what, Merino is 13 microns? So it gives you, it gives you an idea of how small this thing is. Um, I think a blood cell is bigger, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, a blood cell is considerably bigger than uh, the COVID virus particle. Very tightly woven cotton material, like, like really quality quilting fabric, does a pretty good job. A cotton blend t-shirt, like jersey, knit jersey material, which is, if you've ever looked at it in a microscope, uh, the fibers are pretty fuzzy. And because it's knit, it's a completely different structure the material is at the very small level upon which it is woven, at, at which it's woven. Because of that, if you layer these two fabrics, the tightly woven cotton and the knit cotton blend, not 100% cotton, you get quite a bit of good filtration going right there because they aren't going to line up right. If you had two layers of the woven cotton, you have a very good chance that the virus can still get through because the structure that it's going to get through will have holes, microscopic holes, in between those individual threads that are woven together. Whereas if you put the knit material in the way, both the fuzziness of it and the completely different structure adds one more barrier. Now it's very, very easy to breathe through. I say very, very easy. Compared to other things, it's very, very easy to breathe through a layer of woven cotton and a layer of t-shirt 
cotton. And for most people, that is plenty because really what you're trying to do is not so much save your own life as it is save other people's lives because most of the coronavirus transfers so far, according to them yesterday, and today is Thursday, April 23rd, so this was Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. According to them yesterday, the contact tracing that they've done so far indicates that most of the COVID transmissions that happen outside of the hospital, so we're not talking about medical care workers at all right now, uh, most of the transmission that happens outside of a hospital situation is from asymptomatic people, people who show no signs of being sick. So you wearing a mask means you're saving other people's lives just in case you are a carrier. Um, if you think this isn't a big deal, the, the asymptomatic carrier thing, uh, I've got a video on Typhoid Mary that you might be interested in because the reason she was able to pass typhoid on to so many people, well, there were two reasons. Number one, she was a cook in lower Manhattan. So yeah, that was unlucky. And number two, she was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. So she was never sick. So she didn't know that she was a carrier for a really long time and infected hundreds of thousands of people. So if you are so inclined and would like to make masks, please feel free to jump on over to heatherordover.com slash masks. All the information is there. Uh, there's also a um, Kurtzgesagt uh, video, the In a Nutshell YouTube channel. They have the, it's the best COVID-19 information I've seen yet. Succinct, kids can understand it. It explains why we are having such weird symptoms and why some people don't have the same symptoms at all uh, compared to other people, but it's still the same disease. If you're wondering about that, I really recommend watching the Kurtzgesagt um, uh, video on COVID-19. So information, 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 information. I am also making my own ham and sausage. It was about time partially because pressing the seams on the masks require you to press a seam that is very curved. And I have been coming up with all sorts of funny ways to do that with some of my hand knitted socks that I've stuffed <laughs> to within an inch of their life. And I've been pressing seams on that and it's really kind of unruly. So I'm making a ham and I've got a link out to that pattern in case you are interested as well. If you are sitting at home with very little to do, just a reminder that the Globe Theater, uh, Britain's National Theater, and the Royal Shakespeare Company, they are all releasing videos, uh, video recordings of shows that they've done over the last, I don't know, I've seen stuff from the last 10 years probably. Uh, we watched The Treasure Island, and most of these are only up for a limited amount of time. I think Treasure Island goes away tonight. Wow. So good. So much fun to watch. I watched the Jane Eyre. I watched Treasure Island. I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming next. So there's that to watch. Uh, if you are more active in your wanting to entertain yourself, there have been some hilarious art reconstructions where people have taken families of people, groups of people who are living roommates together. They have taken famous works of art and redone them as an art tableau which is something that they do in Long Beach, California every summer. It's a big deal. And, and I'm pretty sure I talked about it on the podcast a couple of times. And, uh, and of course, people have done this historically for a long time as well. Some of these are truly hilarious. Only rivaled, I think, by the woman who was doing like 15th century Flemish paintings, re redoing them in airport bathrooms with like toilet paper and seat covers, which was pretty awesome. Um, so that's something for you to watch and enjoy. Um, all sorts of bootlegs of Broadway shows have been popping up on YouTube. They all seem to include the word slime. So I believe, I believe Beetlejuice was how to make beetle, the word beetle, juice, the word juice, slime. Uh, Hamilton was um, 
tutorial tutorial on making 18th century slime, something like that. They've all got these goofy slime names. Normally, I am not a fan of watching bootlegs of Broadway shows, but my feeling is this. They're out there. The audio and the visual is usually pretty lousy. Nowhere near as cool as going to see a show in person, but none of us are going to be going to see shows in person for a while now. And and at least you can have an entertaining couple of hours where you get to see something you might not have otherwise gotten to see. Not everybody can go to New York or go to a Broadway show, even when they're on tour. So, yeah, you can watch them on YouTube. And when you get a chance, go see a live show someday. Uh, Six, The Six Wives of Henry VIII is very funny. And uh, Lily, one of our listeners who comes to our Tuesday book chats, she got to see it live and in person and said it was a whole lot of fun as well. Uh, On YouTube, there's also some good news that John Krasinski from The Office is doing and Jack Ryan. He's been the recent Jack Ryan. And that uh, every week he has made me cry in a good way. It's been lovely. All he does, Mondays, he releases good news that's been sent to him from people all over the world. That's lovely. Um, I listened to the final Hillary Mantel book in the Thomas Cromwell series. So that was upbeat and fun. Not. Uh, But then I followed it with, I think A.T. Blanton was the one who recommended uh, Andrea Vernon and the Corporation for Ultra Human Protection, followed by Andrea Vernon and the superhero industrial complex. These are Jasper Fordian style books. If you like Jasper Ford, you will love these. Uh, They take place in New York City. The guy who writes them clearly knows his way around the city. Uh, It's a lot of fun and not, not a challenge to listen to which doesn't mean that they're not clever because they're very clever. It's just easy listening. And, uh, and the audible version is superior. The woman who does the narration has a cast of character set of voices that is not to be believed. Uh, only, only outdone, I think, and maybe not even outdone, probably not outdone, by the guy who read We Are Legion, We Are Bob. So there's some of the other things for you to listen to. Uh, If you haven't seen some of my posts in January, end of January, uh, I was laid off along with uh, 60 other people, 100 other people. Um, No, no, 60 other full-time people and 40 contractors. We were all laid off at the same time. Honestly, it was lovely to be able to sleep again and see my kids and not have to commute. And while I, I miss, I miss the scientists Uh, I miss the people that I was working with, but boy, it's been nice to be home. And then when this all happened, it wasn't such a hit, such a shock to the system, which is also kind of nice. So I will be continuing the Tuesday, Thursday book chats for as long as I can. I have no idea what the future holds, but I'm sure having a good time doing them. And we show no signs of really being able to go back to normal yet. So, so. I'll see you Tuesdays or Thursdays. Uh, There's also another YouTube channel, which you may get a kick out of, called The Daily Stoic. And this guy has a a website and a newsletter, and he dispels all of the misleading, mistaken, erroneous stereotypes about what Stoicism is and uh, how it functions as a philosophy of life. Um, it is not Spock. It is not emotionless and unfeeling. It, it is very interesting. And I've, I've included one video of his for you to uh, take a look at. And it's why I start my day with, uh, with Marcus Aurelius, <laughs> which it turns out to be just a compilation of clips from other YouTube videos he's done, but it really kind of in five minutes sticks it all in a nutshell. And it's, it was nice. It was nice to see a different philosophical stance taken. 
So that's cool. Uh, last big announcement is we are undergoing a redesign, a huge entire entire schmickecki the whole shebang is getting redone at craftlit.com um i found people who can help and the whole redesign is happening without me having to do much of anything except for provide imagery and passwords so it's not going to be done in time for us to start the tenant of wildfell, wildfell hall because it's not done right now on thursday april 23rd 2020, but it will be done soon. I will let you know when it is ready for you to go have a look-see, and then please let me know as soon as possible if you are finding problems, errors, things that aren't working well, um, flows, UX information that you think uh, might be helpful for other people or for you yourself, and uh, I'll see about getting that stuff updated. So... <sighs> I think that's all the information that I'd saved up. Now, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. Why are we going to do The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte? Here's why. <laughs> no, it's too much. I sum up. Here's the thing. In 2010, when we were on the trip to London, Bath, and Wales, we went to a yarn store in London. I cannot remember the name of the person who came up to me, but she came up to me in the yarn store. I can remember the yarn we're looking at, but I can't remember her name. And she said, you know, there's a book you really need to do on the podcast because it's exactly up your alley. It is a book everyone should have read. It is a book that's been forgotten or it's a book that people think they know what it's about, but they really don't. And it's written by a woman, and it is more so than her land, a really interesting proto-feminist novel. And I, I actually don't think Anne Bronte would be unhappy with that description. Anne Bronte gets classified, pigeonholed, an awful lot as the youngest sister the lesser known Bronte, the less talented Bronte, the weak Bronte. I mean, I've seen all sorts of bizarre things said about this woman. I'm, I guarantee as we go through this book and I continue researching her, that I will find more and more interesting tidbits to share with you because she is an enigma wrapped inside a kumquat, baked inside a New Orleans king cake and then served with tea on a window seat looking out over the moors. She's really, really interesting. And because there was so much um, mythology built up around the Brontes, starting, starting from them publishing their stories as Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell instead of their real names, which we've talked about before on the podcast, everybody's talked about before, uh, because it started there and then, of course, everybody dies. And then after Charlotte Bronte's death, Elizabeth Gaskell writes the biography about Charlotte, but also about the entire family. And because Ellen Nussie, Charlotte's best friend, who was friends with all of them, was Charlotte's best friend. She kept all of her letters from Charlotte when Charlotte's husband had asked her to burn them because he, he, he was concerned about stories getting out and about people trying to show his wife who was A, his wife, and B, a firebrand, and C, a uh, person of opinion when women having opinions was not really a popular thing to do and be. Um, he didn't want bad stories about his wife to get out or for things to be misconstrued, which of course they would be. And so he asked Ellen Nussie, he asked everybody who had letters from Charlotte to burn them. Ellen didn't 
And then she got her 15 minutes of fame by being Elizabeth Gaskell's main source. Well, Ellen Nussie, as she got older and remained unmarried, watched Charlotte, well, all of the girls, but Charlotte especially, uh, watched the, the fame that surrounded her for the very brief time that she was able to enjoy it with some amount of jealousy and judgment. And so a lot of really unflattering stories about Branwell and about Patrick came out. And when we did Jane Eyre, I mentioned the Juliet Barker book um, that's a, a tome. It is like the OED version of the Bronte family. And I'll, I'll link out to the book on the show notes for you just as just in case you're interested in reading a big, thick book on the Brontes. Juliet Barker's book is in many ways a refutation of the damage that was done by Gaskell's book, specifically when it came to Patrick, the father, and Branwell, the brother. Uh, There's plenty of evidence that Patrick may have been an eccentric father in that he let his young daughters memorize Byron, and which is kind of like, I don't know, memorizing. I was going to say Fifty Shades of Grey, but that's not true because Fifty Shades of Grey was not great literature. Uh, it's certainly racy for young girls to have been reading it. And it shows up in their books that they wrote as adults. So uh, in that way, he was he was quite liberal with his children's education. I think he also was of the mind that if you're old enough to be able to read it and keep reading it, then you're probably old enough to be able to deal with it. Um, I noticed with my own kids at one point, Thing 2 decided he wanted to read The Hunger Games, and I knew he was going to be bored by it in the first two pages. I also knew he was too young, really, for the book, so I made him a deal that he'd have to come and talk to me after he read the first chapter, and then we'd talk about whether he could read the rest of it. He'd never made it through the first chapter. <laughs> so so that was a win. Uh, the other thing that Patrick, though, did was the second he heard that a daughter was sick at school, he picked up and left. He went to get them. He didn't send for somebody else to get them. He. This was a big deal because as the the person in charge of the parish... He had a lot of legal jobs to do, as well as um, jobs that are ministering to someone's particular issue, whether it's a birth or a death or just needing to talk to somebody. Uh, he, it's a big deal for him to have just taken off to go get the girls 20 miles away, uh, especially because he, they get the bad rap of, of people saying, well, he was poor because he had so many children. No, he was poor in many ways. He was poor when it came to liquid assets. He didn't have a whole lot of ready cash. But this was because there was a quiet war going on between the Howarth Parish and a nearby parish. So the people in Howarth had to pay double the church C of E rates because you pay into it's not just tithing it was it was a tax bill they had to pay to two different people and because of that money that should have been coming to patrick who was doing all the work was getting diverted to was it bradford i can't remember the name of the town it starts with b that's nearby anyway so he he just got slighted right left and center by the church leadership and it's very hard to read that section. It's very hard for me to read that section of Juliet Baker's book because it is such an injustice. And as we know, I have an overdeveloped sense of injustice and I get very righteous and upset about that stuff. So, so Patrick wasn't a uh, frugal to be mean, and he also wasn't miserly. They 
obviously had enough money to get the kids to school and get the kids back. But when the kids left school because they had gotten sick, because the place was horrible, uh, he did write to petition to get the school funds that he paid out in advance to get that money back. Um, and, and things like that would happen. So he, he got, re- he just got a bad rap. Branwell's a whole other story that ties in directly to the tenant of Wildfell Hall. One of the reasons why Juliet Barker's book was so important to get through is because she found new evidence. Obviously, with uh, Charlotte's husband trying to get everything burnt so that nobody would be able to tell stories about these women and this family, uh, a lot of stuff got lost. A lot of stuff has been found now as well. And Barker's sleuthing really paid off when it came to Branwell. Branwell and Anne, our Anne, were both stationed at the Robinsons. (laughs) <laughs> yes, there's a Mrs. Robinson. They're both stationed at the Robinson's house. Anne, as the governess to some really unpleasant young girls, and Branwell as the tutor for the boy. Now, <laughs> we will leave aside how little Anne was making versus how much Branwell was making per annum. We'll just let that go for a minute. Anne didn't much like these girls. They were frivolous. They were flirty. They said really inappropriate things about other men, uh, both eligible and married. And she was kind of horrified. But the mom, Mrs. Robinson, was totally unconcerned. It really does seem like as long as the girls looked good, she really didn't care. She was around 40 and still looked great, according to everybody. Uh, and it, and her husband was much older than her and also rather sick. It looks like she and Branwell started an affair. And for her, because there may have been a previous tutor who was involved in the situation as well, for her, it may or may not have been a huge emotional thing. For Branwell, it was enormous. This was the one. This was the woman he loved. And she, I mean, boy, talk about being able to be in a Byron poem. She was the one who was being ignored by her husband. She was being mistreated. Not that she was being abused, but that there was no love in her life. She was lonely. Her children were appalling. And here he was, the one who would be there to save her and help her find fulfillment. Not surprisingly, the husband finds out. How do we know how the husband found out? We know that two different servants, an indoor servant and a gardener, both got paid off with a lot of money. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, was it all told the indoor servant wound up with 100 pounds? And at first people had thought, oh, it was just paying back a loan. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, why would... <laughs> Why would the indoor servant have a hundred pounds on hand that they could loan to the guy who's running and owns the grounds and the estate? That doesn't make any sense. What did make sense was the timing. Branwell leaves and these two people get paid off. Both of them knew or had every reason to know what was going on with Branwell and Mrs. Robinson. Branwell basically gets a a letter when he's home on break that says, you're not coming back. You're not speaking to anyone in this house. You are done. You've gotten the last of the money that you're going to get. And I'm washing my hands of you. Apparently, the thing that was so troubling to Branwell was that he couldn't ever get any sense of closure because he couldn't write to anyone in the house, whether it was another servant or Mrs. Robinson. But he had been told in that letter there would be court, there would be legal action taken 
if he made any attempt to contact anyone. So he didn't. Um, but the, the lack of closure really seems to have been the thing that broke him because that began his downhill slide. Uh, he had never, he, he drank and he had fun before when he was young, but he wasn't stupid about it and he wasn't a drunk. But after he lost Mrs. Robinson and seemed to have nowhere else to go, like he really enjoyed his job, not just because of her, but enjoyed his job being a tutor. Um, I think he also probably liked living in that house and uh, having, being tangential to, you know, he's like wealth adjacent. He gets to be there while not actually being part of it. Um, he he went downhill fast. Um, he got physically ill in that he just wasn't eating. He was clearly depressed. And then he was drinking more. And there's one one phrase that Charlotte used in a letter, I think it was his blasted form, like like a blasted heath, that he was just obliterated. And it's a term that was used sometimes to describe what opium eaters look like. So there's been some discussion about whether or not he got involved in uh, heavier stuff. It's That's the one clue that people can cite, aside from the fact that he died young. Um, but the important thing is for us, Anne Bronte wrote The Tenant of Wildfell Hall before Jane Eyre. But Jane Eyre came out first. So Tenant of Wildfell Hall got ignored or, or overshadowed just because of that. Anne Bronte dies. Charlotte makes arrangements for republication now that, now that they're known, now that the Bronte family is a known quantity, it is no longer a mystery who these people were. Charlotte is known in London as a person herself, an author. She makes arrangements to republish and holds back on the tenant of Wildfell Hall, claiming that the author thinks that the topic of the book, the topic of the book, was an enormous mistake. It should never have been written. That is Charlotte. That's not Anne. Charlotte had issues because she thought, probably mistakenly, that there's a not very nice character in the Tenant of Wildfell Hall who she th either thought was Branwell, that Anne based the character on Branwell, or she thought people would think it was Branwell. And either way, that seems to have been the real reason why she wanted to keep Tenant of Wildfell Hell down. Once you really get into the weeds of who was saying what to whom and when and all of that information, uh, it becomes pretty clear that a couple of things were going on for Anne. While she was governess, she in uh, not just the Robinsons' home, she was I think she had two other homes that she was a governess in. She saw some really bad behavior. And on at least one occasion, she saw really, really bad behavior. Some of that comes out in Agnes Gray. There is a, a rather famous moment where uh, a boy who is like Jeffrey Dahmer in training, he's the kind of kid who tears wings off of butterflies, that kind of kid. He loves to torture birds. And his uncle is kind of training him to do that and therefore, quote unquote, be a man, which is horrifying. Um, Agnes sees a nest of baby birds brought to this child and sees him leering over this nest, trying to decide how he's going to torture them for the rest of the day. You know, that'll be his entertainment. And the character, Agnes Gray, gets a big rock and comes up and smashes the birds, which is horrifying. But she knew she couldn't get the birds away from him. She knew she couldn't remove the nest that he would either 
whine to mommy and daddy and she'd get busted. Or he'd find them and he'd just make it that much worse for them. And so it was a mercy killing, which is horrifying. But that's why I say that people don't really get Anne Bronte. She's tough. And she clearly either was in situations where she had to make tough decisions that were ethical, moral decisions, or she saw situations where she wished she had done something different. And a lot of that winds up in her writing. So we have two main characters, Gilbert Markham and Helen Graham. We are so, so lucky because Maya Daguerre, who read Sense and Sensibility for us and who continues to read for me whenever I need her, and I'm so grateful, uh, she is back to read Helen Graham because Tenant of Wildfell Hall is like an epistolary novel-ish. And at one point, the narrative cuts, and we get to hear Helen's diary. So we get Helen's voice unedited. But the rest of the book is framed, this is our framing device, framed as a letter written by Gilbert Markham to a friend of his. It's a very long letter. <laughs> But that's that's the conceit that is used to tell this tale. Uh, it all happens, not surprisingly, in the northern part of England. Gilbert Markham is interesting because he's a gentleman farmer. So he's educated. He's traveled some. He is the oldest son, which means he's inherited the property. And the property is a farm. And... That means he's not the lord of the manor. They have a nice house, but it's it's not a manor home. Uh, he's working out in the field with his other laborers. He gets dirty and he works hard. And sometimes he gets a little smug about that. And sometimes he feels a little put off by how how much work he has to do. He has a younger brother. Fergus, who is kind of an obnoxious younger brother and who needles Gilbert all the time and is constantly saying insulting things. He's really funny. And he's he's not funny like laugh out loud funny. He's funny like, ha, 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 yeah, I've known people like that. So Fergus is fun. And then there's Rose. Rose is their sister in the middle of the two boys. And she's long suffering and she speaks her mind about the difference in the treatment of men and women within families. And it's so interesting. Anne Bronte is the only one who was really raised 24 seven by her aunt. Her mother died after giving birth to her. The aunt comes up from Cornwall to stay with the family. So she spent, when she wasn't spending her time with her sister, she was with Aunt Branwell. And that means when the older girls went off to school, Anne really, for all intents and purposes, was the one who had a mom for the longest. So the way she deals with family dynamics is really fascinating. And she has this really subtle, wicked sense of humor all the way through the book. And it's, it's one of those things that if you listen and you think, wait a minute, was that a joke? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. I'm going to just guarantee it up front. Yes, she's making jokes. So Gilbert's fun, but he is neither a, a paragon of virtue, nor is he a deeply flawed Byronic hero. He's really a very real person who does stupid things sometimes and makes mistakes, and doesn't own up to it right away. But eventually, you start to see him piecing things together and grasping what he really wants and what he needs to do to get there, what he's going to have to do in self-work to get there, which is 
pretty impressive for a 28-year-old's second book, especially a 28-year-old who's never been married or even really been out with a man. It's pretty impressive. She was clearly a good observer. We are super crazy lucky because that character who is narrating this book is being read by one of Maya Daguerre's friends, Eden Ballantyne. And he's a, an actor, he's a performer uh, up in the north of the country. And he can do the accent for us. And I'm so excited. So we have a Gilbert Markham. We have a Helen Graham. And I could not be happier. Today, I'm going to play you a teaser. So you get to hear their voices a little bit. And then we'll get into the chapters next week. Because I didn't want to make the episode any longer. And because... I could tag the time code and let you know when the teaser was going to start. So I'm going to play you a little bit of the first time Gilbert Markham goes to see Helen Graham with other people. He's already met her and her son. And then I'm going to play you a little clip from Helen Graham's <laughs> uh, the passage that she puts into her diary about how these neighbors, not necessarily Gilbert, but the other people um, who we haven't met in Eden's reading, how the other people treat her, what she thinks of them. And you'll get, get a nice split of both of their voices that way. So I'm going to let you get your introductions to... Helen and Gilbert, and then, uh, and then I'll give you the last bits and let you go on your way. So here we go with a little teaser of Helen and Gilbert, starting with Gilbert. Chapter 7. The Excursion Not many days after this, on a mild sunny morning, rather soft underfoot, for the last fall of snow had only just wasted away, leaving yet a thin ridge here and there, lingering on the fresh green grass beneath the hedges. But besides them already, the young primroses were peeping from amongst their moist, dark foliage, and the lark above was singing of summer, and hope, and love, and every heavenly thing. I was out on the hillside, enjoying these delights, and looking after the well-being of my young lambs and their mothers, when... On glancing round me, I beheld three persons ascending from the vale below. They were Eliza Millwood, Fergus, and Rose. So I crossed the field to meet them, and being told they were going to Wildfell Hall, I declared myself willing to go with them, and offering my arm to Eliza, who readily accepted it in lieu of my brothers, told the latter he might go back, for I would accompany the ladies. I beg your pardon, exclaimed he. It's the ladies who are accompanying me, not I them. For you all had a peep at this wonderful stranger but me, and I could endure my wretched ignorance no longer. Come what would, I must be satisfied. So I begged Rose to go with me to the hall, and introduce me to her at once. She swore she would not unless Miss Eliza would go too. So I ran to the vicarage and fetched her. We've come hooked all the way as fond as a pair of lovers, and now you've taken her from me, and you want to deprive me of the walk and my visit besides, go back to your fields and your cattle, you lubberly fellow. You're not fit to associate with ladies and gentlemen like us, that have nothing to do but run snooking about our neighbours' houses, peeping into their private corners, and scenting out their secrets, and picking holes in their coats, when we don't find them ready-made to our hands. You don't understand such refined sources of enjoyment. Can't you both go? suggested Eliza, disregarding the latter half of the speech. Yes, both, to be sure, cried Rose. The more the merrier, and I'm sure we shall want all the cheerfulness we can carry with us to that great, dark, gloomy room with its narrow lattice windows and its dismal old furniture, unless she shows us into her studio again. So we went all in a body, 
and the meagre old maid servant that opened the door ushered us into an apartment, such as Rosa described to me as the scene of her first introduction to Mrs Graham. A tolerable, spacious and lofty room, but obscurely lighted by the old-fashioned windows. The ceiling, panels and chimney piece of grim black oak, the latter elaborately but not tastefully carved, with tables and chairs to match. An old bookcase to one side of the fireplace, stocked with a motley assemblage of books, and an elderly cabinet piano on the other. The lady was seated in a stiff backed armchair, with a small round table containing a desk and a workbasket on one side of her, and a little boy on the other, who stood leaning his elbows on her knee and reading to her, with a wonderful fluency from a small volume that lay on her lap, while she rested her hands on his shoulder and abstractly played with the long wavy curls that fell on his ivory neck. They struck me as forming a pleasing contrast to all the surrounding objects, but of course their position was immediately changed on our entrance. I could only observe the picture during the few brief seconds that Rachel held the door open for our admittance. I do not think Mrs Graham was particularly delighted to see us. There was something indescribably chilly in her quiet, calm civility, but I did not talk much to her. Seated myself near the window, a little back from the circle, I called Arthur to me, and he and I and Sancho amused ourselves very pleasantly together, while the two young ladies baited his mother with small talk, and Fergus sat opposite with his legs crossed and his hands in his breeches pocket, leaning back in his chair and staring now up at the ceiling, now straight forward at his hostess, in a manner that made me strongly inclined to kick him out the room, now whistling sotto voce to himself a snatch of a favourite air, now interrupting the conversation or filling up a pause, as the case might be, with some most impertinent question or remark. At one time it was, It amazes me, Miss Graham, how you could have chosen such a dilapidated, rickety old place as this to live in. If you couldn't afford to occupy the whole house and have it mended up, why couldn't you take a neat little cottage? Perhaps I was too proud, Mr Fergus, replied she, smiling. Perhaps I took a peculiar fancy to this romantic, old-fashioned place. But indeed, it has many advantages over a cottage. In the first place, you see, the rooms are larger and more airy. In the second place, the unoccupied apartments, which I don't pay for, may serve as lumber rooms, if I have anything to put in them. And they are very useful for my little boy to run about in on rainy days, when he can't go out. And then there is the garden for him to play in, and for me to work in. You see, I have effected some little improvements already, continued she, turning to the window. There is a bed of young vegetables in that corner, and here are some snowdrops and primroses, already in bloom, and there, too, is the yellow crocus, just opening in the sunshine. Alas, my kind neighbours will not let me alone. By some means they have ferreted me out, and I have had to sustain visits from three different families, all more or less bent upon discovering who and what I am, whence I came, and why I have chosen such a home as this. Their society is unnecessary to me, to say the least, and their curiosity annoys and alarms me. If I gratify it, it may lead to the ruin of my son, and if I'm too mysterious it will only excite their suspicions, invite conjecture, and rouse them to greater exertions, and perhaps be the means of spreading my fame from parish to parish, till it reach the ears of someone who will carry it to the Lord of Grasdale Manor. I shall be expected to return their calls, but if, upon inquiry, I find that any of them live too far away for Arthur to accompany me, they must expect in vain for a while, for I cannot bear to leave him, unless it be to go to church, and I have not attempted that yet. For, it may be foolish weakness, but I am under such constant dread of his being snatched away, that I am never easy when he is not by my side, and I fear these nervous terrors would so entirely disturb my devotions that I should obtain no benefit from the attendance. I mean, however, to make the experiment next Sunday and oblige myself to leave him in charge of Rachel for a few hours. It will be a hard task, but surely no imprudence, and the vicar has been to scold me for my neglect of the ordinance of religion. 
I had no sufficient excuse to offer, and I promised, if all were well, he should see me in my pew next Sunday, for I do not wish to be set down as an infidel. And besides, I know I should derive great comfort and benefit from an occasional attendance at public worship, if I could only have faith and fortitude to compose my thoughts in conformity with the solemn occasion and forbid them to be forever dwelling upon my absent child and on the dreadful possibility of finding him gone when I return. And surely, God in his mercy will preserve me from so severe a trial, for my child's own sake, if not for mine, he will not suffer him to be torn away. I hope that wet your whistle. Because it's uh, it's going to be such an interesting book to go through with you guys. I'm so excited. Uh, again, call in if you have questions, comments, things you want to share, information about how to stay safe, 206-350-1642. There is a History Chicks podcast from last fall, I think, where Beckett and Susan do Charlotte Bronte. And it's impossible to do one Bronte without mentioning the rest of them. So they talk about the Tenant of Wildfell Hall and Anne and Emily and all of that. I have found several really interesting websites that have done extensive research. I mean, ridiculously extensive research into the daguerreotype. There is a daguerreotype that people think is most likely Charlotte and Emily and Anne. And this group of people who put up this website went into, there's a hat that Emily is wearing. Was that hat even available? Could you have bought that hat? Because it's a unique looking one. Could you have bought it in that part of the country at that time? The answer, yes. Where would they have gotten this picture taken? They could have gotten it taken in a variety of different places. Daguerreotypes were being done. Would it have been too expensive for them? Not at all. It was a pound, uh, one pound five p, to get a daguerreotype done. Would they have been able to find a place to do it? Yes, absolutely. Um, the picture could only have been taken in like eighteen forty eight, which would have been the year before Emily and Anne died. Yes, that was possible. Um, they, they've they just done an incredible amount of research. The photograph is, or the daguerreotype, is really interesting looking. And on this website, which I'm linking out to, they do a lot of comparisons because while there's only that one painting of the three girls with Branwell looking like a pillar because he painted himself out, there are lots of sketches, not lots, there are several sketches of each of the girls that are done by each other. And there's one, which I'm using as the button for this particular book, uh, that Charlotte did of Anne, which I think is the one that looks the most like an amalgam of all of her visions. Uh, her, her nose seems to be right the way her chin, her chin kind of receded a little bit and her, um, her lips she's just, she's very interesting looking. And, and yes, she was quiet. And yes, she was the youngest, but no, she was not weak. She's really interesting. Uh, So there's a History Chicks podcast you can listen to. They also have a new podcast called The Recappery, where they're recapping shows. They're doing The Crown, Little Women, Marie Antoinette. Um, Ooh, and I need to ask Beckett if she saw the Makara 2's video, which I'm also going to link out to for you because she does this amazing explanation for why she didn't think the costumes in Little Women should have won an Oscar. And it pretty much comes down to bonnets, which happens at the 14 minute mark where she just decides to make a bonnet. It's hilarious, but she's very much a modern YouTuber. Her editing is very fast and furious. So prepare yourself. Beckett and Susan also recommended a a documentary on the Bronte family and that movie, the, what is it, To Walk Invisible? Uh, It's a two-parter series that was done really recently on the Bronte sisters, which is also um, came highly recommended from the two of them. I have not watched it yet, but it's on my list of many things to watch. So, phew, that's a whole lot of information. 
you got your money's worth. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for coming back again and again and again and again to listen to books with me. It makes it so much fun. Stay safe, be good to each other, and I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.